So please join me in welcoming President Mary Lou McDonald to the National Press Club. So um, thank you very much, Gurumila Mahagut Asan Foil Chamor Show, on that uh, extremely uh, warm welcome. And I am really delighted to be here with you this morning, not least because it's been two years um, since we were we were last here. COVID has, as we all know, turned all of our worlds upside down. And I know that uh, just as at home in Ireland, I know that here in the United States, people have suffered greatly and struggled through this pandemic. So can I begin my remarks by extending just that sense of solidarity to all of you uh, in the room and beyond, wherever you are, wherever you come from, and wish you well um, in, in these times where we still face uh, a huge COVID uh, challenge. Uh, I, I should uh, also begin by saying that um, we had a, a very busy day yesterday on the Hill. Um, I had the opportunity to meet with the majority leader in the Senate, uh, Chuck Schumer, uh, Chair of the Ways and Means Committee, uh, Richard uh, Neal, Chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Robert Menendez, uh, also with Senator Chris uh, Murphy, and of course, uh, we met again with the Congressional Friends uh, of Ireland group, and we also had meetings with the State Department and with the administration. Um, I, I want to record, uh, for the record, our deep appreciation for the very solid support that the United States has extended to Ireland in the pursuit of a peace settlement in the Good Friday Agreement of 1998, and then crucially subsequent to that period, on a bar bipartisan basis, supporting the sustainability of that peace settlement uh, and seeing off threats to uh, what has been agreed. And uh, you mentioned Brexit in your introductory remarks. It was clear to us from the get-go that Brexit meant trouble generally, but particularly meant uh, trouble for Ireland. There was the real prospect or possibility of a, a hardening of the border on our <laughs> island. Those of you who have visited Ireland would know that although there are currently two jurisdictions on the island, you can move seamlessly throughout the island and people transact their business and live their lives and, and, and grow old and um, older and wiser. Uh, across the island with no sense that you are moving from one legal jurisdiction to another. You will also know that that wasn't always the case. There was a time when border roads were blocked off, when there was a, a real sense of, of division and, and the reality of conflict on our island. So Brexit then pre presented the, the, the awful vista or possibility of stepping backwards rather than stepping forwards. And to uh, avoid that, um, that damage to the Good Friday Agreement and to our political uh, pro progress, uh, a very exhaustive pro <laughs> pro pro process was undertaken. Um, years of negotiations between the European institutions and the British government, and we landed on this arrangement that is called the protocol. The protocol is the set of legal protections to mitigate the worst aspects of, of Brexit for the island of Ireland. It is necessary, it is operable, and it is going nowhere, despite what uh, Boris Johnson might uh, wish to believe. And I, I want to say that I am very heartened by the fact that um, across politics and on a bipartisan basis, we have heard again yesterday from people of considerable influence that they stand four square with the Good Friday Agreement, they stand four square with the protocol, and they have made very clear to the British administration that any attempt to rupture or to dispense with the protocol will have very negative uh, consequences in respect of any trade arrangements into the future. That stance by the United States of America is a very important one. Um, indeed, at times, uh, the intervention of, of uh, political figures from the states uh, was defining in the course of the Brexit debate. I recall a Codell visiting um, Dublin, Belfast and, and London 
led by Speaker Pelosi uh, and with uh, Chairman Richie Neal. Uh, and at the time, there was um, considerable difficulties in stalling in respect of Brexit. But the intervention of the United States at that point served to clarify matters and to move things forward. So I want to record our appreciation of that and the deep sense of encouragement that I feel um, from what I have heard from key figures uh, yesterday. Um, I would like also to just say to you all that in any peace process and in developing a, a robust democratic system where you're setting out to assert again and again the primacy of politics, that politics can work, um, and finding a way out of uh, conflict, of course, dealing with the past or with legacy, as it's sometimes referred to, is a critical and a sensitive uh, matter. Uh, we managed uh, amongst the parties in, in the North to agree uh, a set of provisions to deal with the past, things that happened to people, people who were victims, people who are survivors of what was a very ugly uh, conflict. The British government has never come to those proposals uh, in a positive uh, way. And in fact, uh, as we speak, they are currently preparing to publish legislation which would afford an amnesty to British soldiers, to those that worked as proxies um, and in collusion with the British uh, state. Uh, what they are proposing to do is um, absolutely a breach of the Good Friday Agreement, would cut the legs from under the Storm and House Agreement in which we agreed the correct approach for dealing with the past. They are well aware that uh, nobody on the island of Ireland, if they are Republican, Nationalist, Unionist, Loyalist, the Irish government in Dublin, nobody wants or supports this amnesty. It is um, conceived of by the Tory government and they look set to press ahead with that. Um, and just to give you an idea of the scope of what they propose, it would mean, in effect, that there would be no possibility for criminal actions, civil actions, even inquests into killings um, of the past. And as many of you will know, many families waited for decades just to get even the most basic answers to, to have an inquest into the loss uh, of a loved one. Uh, it's always been clear to us that the British would go to um, some ends to, uh, to keep the truth from people in respect of their war in Ireland, but they are now going to the ultimate to the ultimate point with this proposal for amnesty. We've raised this with all of those figures that I mentioned uh, earlier in respect of Brexit uh, on the Hill and the administration. And, and we expect um, that the United States will be on the right side of this issue. And the right side of this issue is to stand with victims and survivors. The right side is to, um, uh, is to prevent uh, an, any amnesty and to challenge the British government very forcibly on their proposal. Um, the final thing in, in, in these brief remarks that, that, that I, I, I would like to address, I, I suppose, is the question of what next and where next for Ireland. Because in 1998, due to uh, acts of considerable political courage and vision by all of the stakeholders, uh, we concluded an agreement that afforded us the democratic infrastructure, the institutions to mediate what had been a very, very long and very, very bitter conflict. Um, and that was uh, an enormous achievement and huge credit is due to everybody who was involved in that. But history didn't stop uh, in Easter uh, 1998 and Ireland has moved on. The world indeed has moved on. And we are coming to a point now, we believe, over the next five years to 10 years, where we will make a decision in respect of the constitutional future of Ireland. In other words, we are facing into the holding of referendums north and south, in which the question will be put uh, around the removal of the border and the ending of partition, the reunification of our island. The island, as you know, is um, partitioned a century this year. 
So we are 100 years on and we are now on the threshold of writing the next chapter of Irish history. And uh, I have raised uh, with our own government, of course, uh, in, in Dublin, but also with the American administration, the absolute urgency and need to begin preparations now for that constitutional transition. And so I can be very clear on this matter. What I wish to see and what I envisage is an orderly, organized, democratic and peaceful transition to a reunified Ireland. I believe that we can do that. I believe that the opportunities that we face as an island, as a people, uh, once divided, but that will be so much stronger when united. Our, our opportunities are immense. I think this is a moment of great optimism and excitement for Ireland. I don't believe that anybody should come to the reunification debate with a heavy heart or a, or a sense of foreboding, but with an eye on the big prize, an, an eye on the win for everyone. And uh, of course, the bulk of preparation for these referendums needs to be led at home on the island of Ireland, involving all of us of all political perspectives and persuasions. But of course, there will be a, a need for a international support um, and international intervention to support Ireland as we move to transition from partition to reunification. So we've started those conversations with key uh, individuals here in the United States and I look forward in the coming weeks and months to deepening that sense of how the United States, how key sectors, um, opinion makers and leaders, those with diplomatic and political clout uh, here in the United States, how they can support now Ireland's uh, journey to reunification. The Good Friday Agreement makes provision for referendums north and south, so it is entirely consistent with the peace settlement, with the peace agreement, that we, that we start now to take this next and final defining step uh, forward. So um, thank you all for being here. I look forward now to our conversation. And Gramaigov Rish Time Lan Sosta the Van so uh I'm absolutely delighted to be here with you and I, I look forward to fielding your questions and to hearing your comments. Gramaigov. Okay. <laughs> um I was just going to remind everybody, if you have questions, please write them on a card and pass them to the front, or you can email them in and uh, somebody will write them down for me and bring them to me. So we'd like everyone to participate in the conversation today. Uh, thank you very much, President McDonald, and I apologize for the coughing. Um, <laughs> so I actually want to start with you, what you just talked about, the big sure. goal, mm -hmm. because you know, having grown up in the United States, I remember thinking, oh, Germany will always be two countries. Mm -hmm. And obviously that has changed. It never, you know, it seemed, it would have seemed to me almost impossible, the idea that Ireland would reunify. You're talking about it as an inevitable next step. So can you just talk about why uh, you see this as sort of, it seems inevitable, at least the way you're discussing it. So um, I think that, um, Big ideas, you know, in the, in the kind of the full landscape of, of history, ideas come of age and come into their own time. And for me and, and for us now, um, a century on from the partition of Ireland, um, decades on from the, the, the first flashpoints of the civil rights movement and the conflict in the, the North, almost 25 years on now from the Good Friday Agreement. And in an Ireland that is changed very profoundly in, in many, many ways, um, for example, in, in the north of Ireland, the unionist majority, electoral majority is gone. And as you know, the border was drawn on, on the island of Ireland specifically to ensure a permanent inbuilt unionist majority in perpetuity forever. That forever now is over. 
and the electoral majority of unionism is gone. And as importantly, the expectations now of Irish people, particularly I think younger generations, are different. And rightly so. I mean, this is a good thing. This is how progress is, is driven. People see the world uh, differently. And it was, it was very obvious when Brexit happened and uh, when, you, when you started talking particularly to, to younger people, say at university or college or in that phase of their life where they're figuring out how to live their best life and where their best opportunities might lie, there was a real sense of, um, of uh, hurt and harm that they had been cut off from uh, Europe, that, that somebody beyond them, even though they had voted to remain, decided that actually they were going to be pulled out. And they didn't like the notion of kind of living in splendid isolation. And for, for a lot of, of those people, the question therefore around the border, the constitutional question, the issue of partition, isn't just about now Irish unity, yes or no. It's also about your relationship with Europe and what you believe that should be. So that has, that has had undoubtedly a, a very, very dramatic effect in how the debate has been shaped. But you see, fundamentally, the reason why um, this will happen, in my view, and there is nothing in life inevitable. They say death and taxes, isn't that it? Yeah. And Brexit, <laughs> uh, it seems. So, but the reality is we live on a small island. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, we, sometimes we have delusions of scale. We, we live on a small, incredibly beautiful island. And it makes no sense at all. In fact, it is bad that we have two health systems, two educational systems, two currencies, two of this, two of that, on such a small island. In fact, in so many ways, partition cuts off our nose to spite our face, if I can use that term. And the opportunities for um, economic scale, for innovation in, uh, in everything, for public service provision, is so much greater when we work together. And in fact, Irish business in many ways has been ahead of the curve, ahead of other sections of opinion on the island in recognizing that the smart way to do business, the smart way to be entrepreneurial and to invest is to operate on an all-island uh, basis. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, one of the consequences of Brexit and the protocol has been that all island trade, north to south, south to north, has spiked now. Um, but they, they reckon by some uh, 1 billion euros, and it might be higher than that when the figures come in. So I, when you ask me why will this happen, I, I think it's, it's the political context of now, the fact that the kind of the colonial strategy of divide and conquer and an artificial inbuilt majority, that has, that's gone now. There's been generational change, but there's also the imperative for us now to actually do what's right for Ireland because all of us, whatever your, your political or constitutional perspective, I think we can all agree that we want the best for our families, our communities, for our kids, and we want Ireland to win Does the to British succeed. government have the ability to block it? The, as per the Good Friday Agreement, the, the British government get to call the referendum in the north. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we have asked them many times to set out for us what they believe would be the threshold or the benchmark that would trigger a, a referendum. They've never, they've never been forthcoming um, in that. I mean, the, the British government, to be consistent with the Good Friday Agreement, ha have to recognise that it is for the people of Ireland, north and south, to decide our future. That's what the Good Friday Agreement says. So to be consistent with that, the, the British government needs to take a neutral position. Now, that's not what they do. They clearly adopt a, a unionist position. Um, and it, Boris Johnson's uh, administration has not been helpful or supportive, in, in my view, of uh, the, the peace settlement in Ireland. On the contrary, I think that there have been moments where he has acted in a way that is utterly reckless. Um, but he cannot stop and he cannot prevent progress and he, he cannot be allowed and he will not be allowed to tear up the Good Friday Agreement in any of its aspects, including our right 
two referendums. This is now an agreed position. I didn't dream this up on my way over uh, to speak to you folks today. This is something that we have agreed. We have agreed that this is the method that we will adopt for Ireland to decide our future. And the exciting point now is that we are, we are coming to that moment where those questions will be put. And my primary point, therefore, is let's prepare for that. Mm -hmm. I was saying to you earlier when we were chatting and we were reflecting on Brexit, do you remember when the question was put to the Tories, so what's Brexit? Uh -huh. And the answer was, well, Brexit is Brexit. I mean, that's clearly not a sufficient answer. And the Irish are much more canny than that. There's no one in Ireland going to say, well, unity is unity. You know, mm -hmm. that's not going to be a sufficient response. So there's real work to be done now. And the, the government in Dublin, uh, I think, now has to behave responsibly um, and convene a citizens' assembly, a forum, in which we can officially say, Ireland, let's talk to each other and let's begin the preparation now. And I think there is, in fact, I know, there is huge public support for that. Okay. You said that um, you will need the support for this from the US. Yeah. What concrete things would you ask of President Biden or his administration in, in terms of support? Is it sort of moral support? Is it public, we, we think this should happen? Or is there some physical, concrete thing they can do? Well, I, I think it's a, a mixture of those things. I mean, I'm, I'm very conscious that, um, historically speaking, and we could reference back to the granting of the visa to my predecessor, Jerry Adams, to come here mm -hmm. in the first. I mean, that was, that was a risky call at the time by the Clinton administration, but my goodness, it's one that absolutely paid off and huge credit is, is, is due for taking that very brave decision. But you could go back further than that and you could recall that you know, even the, the, the rising in 1916, you know, our, the foundation document of the Irish Republic recognises the support of what they call our exiled children in America. The truth is that America and the United States has always been part of the story of freedom and progress and advancement and then peace uh, in Ireland. So why would that, why would that change now? Concretely, um, we have asked of the administration, but also on a bipartisan basis, of, of, of uh, the United States to stand firm with the Good Friday Agreement, faithfully implementing its terms, including our right to uh, a referendum, and to use its um, influence to uh, facilitate what will be, I think, a very challenging in some parts, a very necessary and a very exciting dialogue on the island. Very often, um, in, in crafting the peace process, uh, all those who are involved will tell you so much was learned from the United States, from South Africa, from others, from international experience, international um, goodwill and international wisdom because we don't, have, we don't have all of this figured out. And we know for sure that there are there are sections of uh, society and, and politics here in the United States that can assist Ireland in navigating this journey. Okay. I'm gonna to turn to some current events. Um, question from the audience. The Fita Financial Times is reporting that the US has delayed lifting tariffs on UK steel, you mentioned this earlier, and aluminum because of Brexit and protocol concerns. What is your reaction to that? The United States um, has been extremely clear that it stands with the Good Friday Agreement, that it stands with Ireland, and that it will not tolerate or countenance any um, damage, and, and that the British government cannot dispense with the protocol. I mean, I very much welcome the clarity of position from President Biden, from the entire administration, and that that view is held uh, across the, the political divide here in the United States. I think it's a very important stance. I think it is critical that Boris Johnson and his government understand that they cannot play fast and loose with the Good Friday Agreement with the Irish Protocol, and that there is an expectation, not just in Ireland, but internationally, that they honor <coughs> their agreement. So Britain now has a choice to make. They, they honor their agreements. They respect the fact that their Brexit can't be you know, can't damage <coughs> Ireland, um, or, or if they choose not to, clearly there will be, there will be uh, consequences for them. Um, and what I heard yesterday on the Hill 
was a very clear, the clearest possible uh, articulation across the board that uh, any notion of, of walking away from the protocol is simply not acceptable. It's not acceptable to us in Ireland and it's not acceptable in the United States. And I think that is a very welcome and a very, very clear message. Okay. Was the timing related to your visit here, do you think? I would doubt that. Okay. I mean, it may perhaps, perhaps the, the stars align. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I don't have a controlling interest in the Financial Times or, <laughs> or their journalism. So. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I meant the, <laughs> the delay in the lifting the of the tariffs. Well, no, we, I mean, we noted that that, that, was, um, that happened in October. I mean, okay. the tariffs had, were lifted for Europe and, and not for Britain. And I mean, I can't okay. comment on, on, on that matter. That's a matter for the US administration. But, but the critical thing is, it is absolutely clear, and there is no doubt uh, where the United States stands on this matter. Uh, Boris Johnson, if he believes that he can simply walk away from the protocol, he is wrong, mm -hmm. and, and there, there, there will be consequences internationally for Britain if he chooses that reckless course of action. Okay. There's been some criticism in Ireland, especially, um, about a thousand dollar a plate fundraiser held in, New, uh, I think, in New York by Sinn Féin. They've called it the Champagne Socialists, your mm. party. What is your Indeed. reaction to that? I'm more Prosecco than Champagne. Um, <laughs> look, um, actually, there has been no fundraiser now for, for two years or so. Okay. And um, there was a recent event. I don't think there were plates involved because it was actually a golfing tournament. Oh, okay. But th the point is this. Friends of Sinn Féin is a very, very strong organisation and I think it reflects uh, so well on people in America, in the United States, in New York and beyond, who have consistently taken a deep interest in Irish affairs, in supporting the Good Friday Agreement, the peace process, Irish reunification. So these folks want to be active, want to be supportive, um, and they, they raise uh, money and that money is used to campaign, to lobby, and it's spent here in the United States. So it's a good news uh, story and uh, whatever about um, being called socialists of the champagne variety or other, uh, the, the more important point <coughs> is that it reflects again the huge interest that there is in Ireland. And I think that's a great credit to people. To keep faith with, with home, I think is, I think that's actually a very moving thing. I think that's a very patriotic expression. What's your position on Kava? <laughs> on Kava, Kava. yes, <laughs> indeed. Well, we could explore this perhaps later. Okay. <laughs> uh, the Ulster Unionist Party is also in Washington this week. Uh, so are you that, worried yeah. about their renewed focus on the US? No, I think it's very good that uh, people talk to each other. I mean, I, I think it's necessary. I've, ju I've just said very clearly that we need to have a conversation and we need to prepare. And of course, uh, unionist colleagues and unionist communities need to be part of that. I think that's a re really, really important thing. You know, life in so many ways is all about change. That, that's the nature of, of how we exist as, uh, as people. It's how societies um, advance. And there will be no prize for anybody. It doesn't matter your political perspective if you bury your head in the sand and you pre pretend that if you don't deal with something that, that it will go away. So I, I take it as a very positive message that colleagues from the Ulster Unionists are here. They say they were here to talk and to make friends. To me, that, that's all to the good. We should, I hope we see more of that, actually. Mm -hmm. And I hope that this is a, a moment where that engagement in, in talking about Ireland and talking about our future actually is stepped up by political unionism, I think that's a very positive thing. Are they strong in their opposition to your position on? They're unionists. Yeah. I mean, they, would, they will argue for a maintenance of the union, and but I respect that. That is entirely their prerogative. Um, they won't have a veto. Mm -hmm. You know, they can't veto. No section of opinion anymore can say, this cannot advance because we hold a veto or we hold all of the cards. That, that day of like a, single party state and, and all that went with, that's long gone. I mean, that's consigned to the dustbin of history. So of course they will advance their position and I would expect nothing, nothing less uh, from them. But I also believe and I hope 
that even for those for whom Irish unity is not their first option, mm -hmm. and even for those who say, I won't vote for that, that nonetheless they can see their place in that reunified Ireland. So Doug and um, who was with him? And, and Mike, sorry, Mike Nesbitt, need to be part of that conversation around what this new Ireland looks like. And there's plenty of scope for those conversations to happen. And, and by the way, this, this conversation is happening all across Ireland now. People are now talking about reunification. It's not just a Sinn Féin niche issue. Far from it. This is a national question. This is a national opportunity. And this is a national challenge. That means every person needs to claim their space and be involved um, in this process. Okay. Um, I'm just going to quickly run back to the Friends of Sinn Féin because somebody uh, asked that you're, you're speaking to them this evening in New York, is that correct? Well, I'm, I'm speaking at an event organized by the New York Bar um, on the issue of Brexit. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, then this yeah. question, I apologize, no. is not true. But, but, um, but what, is, what do you plan to say this evening? Is it going to reflect what, what we're talking about today? Do you have any yeah, different um, messages? So we're going to, we, we'll reflect on uh, Brexit in the first instance because that's a, a matter of interest to people and, and where things are at. But you can't really talk about uh, Brexit in isolation from the wider challenges, as I set out earlier, in respect of compliance with the Good Friday Agreement. Mm -hmm. um, the need to hold on to the very considerable progress that we have made. But equally, you can't talk about Brexit and not talk about the future, because it begs the question, I mean, uh, Emmanuel Macron um, perhaps in an un unguarded moment, um, mm -hmm. said at one stage, look, we all know what the answer to Brexit is and the problem with the Irish border. The answer is Irish reunification. And um, he was correct in that assessment. And How'd that go over? In well, I mean, it, well, it went very uh, well over uh, with me. I, I, was, I was glad <laughs> to hear somebody say out loud what is manifestly obvious. Um, so... For, for lots and lots of people now, from different perspectives, the issue of the Irish border now looms large. And, and in reality, Brexit has been a game changer. It has meant that the partition of Ireland, the border in Ireland, is now no longer only an Irish problem. It's now a European problem. And I would expect and anticipate that uh, Europe takes an ongoing interest. I mean, they've already, as you know, made clear um, some time back at, at, in the early stages of Brexit that pending, you know, as and when Ireland is reunified, that the entire island, again, will enjoy full membership of the European Union. And I, I think that was an initial statement and position from Europe, which set out very clearly that the entirety of Ireland is part of that European uh, family. So I expect that that position in time will deepen and develop. Uh, and I believe that Europe uh, will need, just as uh, we're, we're asking for support from the United States, Europe has been very supportive in the peace process and, and Europe needs to be supportive um, and facilitatory in the, in the reunification process too. That's a good, uh, I appreciate this question. Um, Barbados declared itself a republic so this week and rejected yeah. Queen Elizabeth as head of state. And actually the Prime Minister of Barbados was here just two years ago as well. Really? Um, yeah, she's an impressive woman. Um, question is, will Barbados' step influence Ireland? Do you have any? Well, it's funny, whoever is asking me that question, I was saying to colleagues, I had actually heard um, Prince Charles' speech at that event, and I thought it was an, an incredibly interesting speech that recalled the past and the obscenity of slavery, and that was very, very uh, honest, I thought, in, in the assessment of what had happened. There was, no, there was no spin, there was no whitewashing. And then wishing Barbados the best for the future and recognizing this very significant move to the status of a republic and having a directly uh, elected president. And I said in my mind, I want to hear that speech. I look forward to the day when I hear that speech, perhaps from uh, a monarch, the, 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 a British king mm -hmm. in respect of, of Ireland. So I think it's, it's extremely hopeful for the international community when you see a country 
a territory land, you know, at that moment of full democratic, you know, um, self-determination. It, it, it's, it's, it's a very significant thing. So, um, so yes, I followed that with some interest and I, I only hope given that, um, that I'm now here two years after my uh, colleague, that perhaps uh, there, there might be something in that. <laughs> Maybe. Um, on that note, uh, you know, on parallels, I do wonder about Germany. Obviously, the, the division of Germany was much more dramatic in terms of, you know, the, the lifestyles on the East and West and the sharing, uh, you know, the ability for people to visit each other and that kind of thing. But do you see lessons? Um, in the reunification of Germany? Absolutely. Yeah. And do you, do you have people that you consult with or do you expect to? Well, I, I, I think undoubtedly there are now. It, it, it would be, of course, far too crude to, to make a, a direct mm -hmm. equation between Ireland and, and Germany. Germany is, is bigger. It was, it was more complex and it, it came. The, the partition and division of Germany had an entirely different historic backdrop. Mm -hmm. And then a, a, an entirely different um, context. But I suppose lesson number one, and this is an obvious thing, you don't need to be an expert on reunification processes to, to realize this, is that question of preparation. I mean, the Berlin Wall, the, the wall came down, and it, it, as, as dramatic, cathartic uh, political moments go, it would be hard to match or equal it. You know, it was one of those defining moments, not just for Germany. Mm -hmm. but for the world you know when things like this happen they have an implication for the world um so you had that moment of high drama and emotion and and release and and then afterwards the 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 work of of reassembling uh reintegrating a society an economy you know aligning expectations social expectations community expectations and um so I think for us in Ireland, the, the first lesson is to plan as best we can, because you, you can't plan for everything. But for those things that are within your control, where you can intervene and where you can prepare, make the preparations. That's an investment in our future. I think it's the smart thing to do. I think it's the wise thing to do. I also think it's the respectful thing to do, given that we have different aspirations on the island and different experiences. I think the respectful thing to do for every citizen is to have a process that is open, comprehensive, transparent, inclusive, that there is a welcome on the door for every view. Um, I think that is the way that, that you advance. And we're a small island, as I said, and our our economies, whilst there are differences for, for certain sure, north to south, they are not so vast uh, that they can't be bridged. And in fact, with, with, with you know, as I say, with preparation and planning, um, there, there is no challenge that we can't get on top of. One of our biggest challenges, by the way, and one of the things okay. that's most often raised with me when, when the issue of reunification is raised with, with people from all sides, is the issue of our healthcare system because we, we have a lot of work to do in, in Ireland uh, in terms of a properly resourced public health care system. So people want to talk about that. And, and I think the German experience and every experience of change is involve people and you know, give people notice and involve, you know, and, and, and do the work, okay. yeah. Now, when, you, when we were talking earlier and you mentioned in your speech, um, this question of uh, the Johnson government wanting to uh, pass this legislation that I guess provides amnesty essentially to British soldiers mm -hmm. from the troubles. Um, is that inevitable? Is that going to happen? Or do you have a mechanism to oppose it? Or does the Northern Irish... Irish uh, so there, yeah, I mean, the, the question of, of how to deal with the past, with victims, with survivors, has naturally been a vexed one and a sensitive one. Um, and it, you're, you're dealing with a scenario where because we cannot turn the clock back, we can't turn back time, you can never fully undo the damage that conflict does. Mm -hmm. that, that's the great tragedy uh, of it. But nonetheless, at Stormont House um, Agreement, we managed 
unionists, loyalists, republicans and nationalists, the parties in Ireland managed to agree the different strands and mechanisms that we would use to give to victims and survivors the full range of options as to how they wish to proceed. Because for some, it was simply to know what happened and why. And, and for some, they would say, I, I, I don't want ever to be in a court of law. I, I don't want a conviction. I, that's not the path I want to. For others, that is their, their preferred option is the court and the, the, the criminal justice system. So Stormont House allowed for all of that full range, including truth telling and, and so on. And um, from the get go, as I said, the British government were very, very non-committal and negative about that approach. And they cited concerns around national security mm -hmm. and to put the kibosh, put the stop on that. And this idea of amnesty isn't a new one. They had advanced it several times. We've, we've knocked them back on it many, many times. But this time, under the Johnson administration, it seems to us that they are determined to move this legislation. And in fact, there was a round table convened in Belfast two days ago. Um, our foreign minister was there. The British uh, Secretary of State was there. And arising from that, our, our firm belief is that the British government will move this legislation, perhaps on the run into Christmas, more than likely after Christmas. But Boris Johnson uh, has, has made a manifesto commitment to protect his boys and his troops, and it seems that that is what they will do. Now, let me say this. I, I know from talking to families and campaigns that legislation will be challenged in the courts. Okay. I mean, victims and survivors will not simply roll over and accept that, but they should not have to go through all of that, given that so many of them have waited literally for decades, even to have just a simple inquest. So Britain has been very clear, the system does not want the truth told about their part and their actions in the conflict in Ireland. And that's what this is about. This amnesty is about British soldiers, their proxies, those that they colluded with. It's not about any other actor any other combatant group, it's about the British um, military. Okay. So we're going to wrap up in just a moment, but before we do, I want to take a moment to thank our headliners, co-team leaders, Donna Lyon-Juan Leger and Laurie Russo, who organized this event, and our club <coughs> executive director, Bill McCarran. And um, upcoming, we'd like you to join us for more headliners events. We have a headliners newsmaker with Harris County Judge Lena Hidalgo on December 7th. And on December 20th, Dr. Anthony Fauci will join us for a virtual headliners newsmaker. And now my final question is a bit selfish. Um, <laughs> growing up as an Irish girl in Massachusetts, there was the legend that you could, if you could prove your grandparents or maybe your great grandparents were born in Ireland, you could get citizenship. Do you have any plans to make it easy for people like me to get citizenship <laughs> in Ireland? Um, I, I always, um, I'm always uh, kind of mindful of the fact that in, uh, for so many of our great sporting successes <laughs> uh, are due to what they call the granny rule, you know? So many of our, so our, our great sporting greats um, <laughs> came from well, the States or from, from, from Britain. Um, I think that the, the ties between um, Ireland and the United States are worth fostering. And worth doing, you know. I really do. It's. Um, I think it's extremely important for families back home um, to have that sense um, of connection here. And I, I often think of, you know, if you think about back in the time when your family made the the journey. Mm -hmm. I mean, how vast that was. How, you know, you went and you you didn't come back, and maybe you didn't see your family again. And it's changed now because the world's like a a global village. So whatever about the the citizenship issue for yourself, and I, you have my sympathies. All of us want to be Irish, you know? I'm Irish, what, what's your superpower? You know? uh, but we, we have an issue here around um, folks that are undocumented, and I'm, I'm conscious of Irish people who can't get home, and, who, and, and we need a process of regularizing that, as, as, as you're uh, well aware. 
Uh, but as, as far as I'm concerned, there will never be too many Irish people in the world. <laughs> there will be never, never too many of us Fair. part of this incredible, this incredible global uh, family. So you are welcome to make your application. And I wish you well. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me. Thanks so much thank for being so much. here. And uh, I just want to give you the token of our appreciation. Oh, fantastic. Much coveted National Press Club coffee mug. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank thank you. you so much.